So recently, in a used parts hustle, got on the Facebook Marketplace, found these HP Elite Desks, the A100, SFF, G1, and they were with the i7 4th gens, and we picked them up for $35 a piece. Gave them a thorough cleaning, made sure that they at least had 16 gigs of DDR3 memory, popped in a W4100 Fire Pro along with a SSD, and these things were able to game at 1080p and with some good bang for the buck. So in today's video, we're gonna take everything out and we're gonna swap it into a better case. And I'm gonna show you how to defeat all the annoying errors for the USB, the audios, and everything that you need so you can do a successful case swap and kind of give yourself more opportunities for future upgrades. So doing the case swap on this is very simple, believe it or not. So a while ago, I actually had the HP Z240 and I did a case swap guide on it and everything you need to do. And after doing some research and messing with this, it's exactly the same thing, no difference. And we'll go over that with it. So we're gonna go over what we need, what pins we need to jump, and how simple this is. Now typically, lately, HP has been my favorite and I'd rather pay money and buy these used than get an Optiplex. At this point, if I get an Optiplex, I only take them if they're free, but I haven't been paying for Optiplexes because this is so much easier and cheaper. And one of the questions I get asked all the time, why do this? Well, number one, this is actually a really good motherboard. Intel 4th Gen supports up to 32 gigs of DDR3, and the case swap, like I said, is way easier. Not to mention that these motherboards can be found on eBay for as low as $10, even $20. And the only expense that you have to buy is the power adapter for it, which those cost $10. So for $20, you're actually getting a pretty good motherboard. So to get started, first thing that we gotta do is we gotta take apart everything inside here. The only thing that you're gonna need is the motherboard and the CPU cooler, and we'll talk about why specifically the CPU cooler. Take everything out, it's gonna be flathead screwdrivers because HP loves using those weird screws and toss them, get rid of them. They're definitely not worth it. You keep your SATA cables and that's about it. We don't need any other adapters or anything, unlike the Optiplex where some of them you need some uh, air temperature sensors and a couple little other things, but this, just the motherboard and the CPU and the heatsink. So one thing you will need is these little jumpers. You could get like a pack of these. I think they're like a hundred for like five or $10 on Amazon. I'll post the link below. And we'll need these to do some jumpering, which is very simple, no modding or anything if you wanna do this the easiest way. The next thing you're gonna need is some of these plastic washers and these nuts. The size for them are number six, dash 32 by one inch. Now, the reason why it says one inch is because I actually bought these in a pack which actually came with the bolts, but all we need is the nuts for them. And we'll talk about that in just one second when I show you how to mount the CPU cooler. Now, probably the biggest expense, if anything, for this case swap over here is you'll need this adapter. This is to convert the motherboard to standard 24 pin. You have to make sure that you get the one for the 800 G1. I've seen a lot of different ones that are not specifically for the G1, 800 G1 motherboard and if you don't use them either the system won't power on you'll get boot loops or the CPU fan will spin at high speed all the time with no control on it so make sure that when you get on Amazon and I'll post the link to this one that it says specifically for the 800 G1 if not you will run into issues the Z240 does use a slightly different one from this so don't get caught up getting the wrong one now the first thing that we're going to do first is we're going to go ahead and mount our CPU cooler. So now if you look at the mounting holes for this motherboard, it is not your traditional mounting hose, holes and you can't use a other style cooler. Now some people do have some adapters and some things that they've done, some modding, but honestly this, this cooler is more than adequate for this 4th uh, gen Intel i7 and considering that we're going to be putting this in a bigger case with more airflow, cooling is not going to be an issue. So now some people what they do is they take the case and they kind of cut out the back um, that these mount onto and they kind of do some ghetto modding for it but now make sure you get these bolts like I talked about I got these at a local hardware store and you should be good I do recommend getting these plastic washers you can also get these at these local hardware store and the reason why is is that when you tighten in the back if something touches in the back you reduce the chance of it shorting to the motherboard and I've seen that happen and I've actually had that happen to me so just for clearance reasons make sure you get these plastic washers but good precaution. So let's go ahead, let's pop in our thermal paste. I've already cleaned off our old thermal paste. Let's just get our new one in. Let's just put a dab, we'll go with the P-ish drop method. Perfect. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and it's gonna get mounted this way as it would in the case. 
this sucks in fresh air and this blows out the hot air so in the back of your case you want to make sure they have an exhaust fan can you mount this this way no because it won't reach the cpu pin connector right up here so all we're going to do is we're going to take this in screw it down just like that we're going to take our plastic washer like so you're going to hold it could be a little tricky and you're going to feed your plastic washer on one of them just like that take our nut and just kind of loosely thread it in. Try not to cross thread this. All right, now that we've done that, we can take this and do each one. Now that we've done that, these have the Torx or the flathead. That's what I'm going to use. It's just a flathead screwdriver on it. And typically, I just hold the back and just tighten these until they can slightly spin. This thing doesn't require a ton of pressure. And there we go. And I'll do that for all the other ones. Now that it's done, we could plug in our CPU fan header. And our CPU is ready to go. And as you can see, we have our bolts in the back. We have our nuts in the back right over here, holding everything down. This thing is secured, and it's mounted. Next is our power supply adapter, which is interesting because this black one right over here is actually not for this. This actually goes into the white one right over here. I don't know why they didn't cord, uh, color coordinate it when they did this adapter. That goes plugged in right over here. This black one right over here is for actually for your SATA power. So if you wanted to run your SATA powers, you can actually use this. We don't need to do that. We're just going to run it through the power supply. And then this right over here goes plugged in. And there we go. Into our 24 pin. And then our CPU power is standard right over here. So we could plug that in and we're good to go. So now for the front power LED and the front power. This is so easy, very simple, and there really is nothing to it. So if you look right next to this white connector right over here, there's actually 10 pins right over there, and you can see that there's a hole right on the top over here. So I went ahead and drew a diagram to kind of show it and explain it a lot better. So this is how you actually see it on the motherboard. If you look right over here, and you look right over there, that's exactly how it is. So now if you look at our pins, this is from left to right, just as you see it on the motherboard. So the first two on the right hand side, they're blank. The ones on the bottom right over here, as you can see, is our power button. The one next to it is our hard drive LED. And the one above it is our power LED. No cutting, no splicing, plugs in just as is. So now we could take our hard drive one, pop it in just like this. This is our power switch, which goes right over there. And then if we want our power LED, which I'm just gonna use this one, it goes right on top of the hard drive LED. So now, so you kind of see it, it's gonna look something just like that. And I know the camera doesn't do it justice, but if you look right over here, power LED on the top goes closest towards the CPU, hard drive right below it, and our power LED right next to it. Very simple, no cutting, no splicing, no modding. So for the front audio, this is the easiest one of them all. It requires no modding or anything. Just plug it right into this blue header from the case that you have, and that's it. No splicing, no grounding, that is it. And you don't have to change the wires or anything just like that. So that's probably the easiest one to plug in. All right, so the next one that we're going to talk about is the USB 1 error. And that is this yellow connector right over here. And this is for your front USB. So if you look at it, it's a 10 pin connector. The one on the top left, and this is actually going towards the IO, the one on the top left is actually missing a pin, which is normal, so you don't reverse them. The pin below it is actually used for HP. And now typical connectors, they don't use that, they only use eight, eight pins. So that pin right over there is actually your signal pin. And if that pin is not grounded out, then it's gonna create the error USB. So now what you do is the pin next to it, and this is on that bottom row, is actually a ground pin. So what you can do is you could junction these two pins over here, the pin right over there, and the pin next to it on the bottom, and that will actually create the ground short that it needs to get rid of that error. To show you on my diagram, I drew it up. This is the blank pin that we're talking about. You have 10 pins. These right over here, two, four, six, eight, are the ones that are commonly used. This is the ground pin. And this is the signal pin. You junction these two pins and this disables it. Now, when we get to the connector, you can actually junction it on the connector. It gets rid of the error and the USB one will still work. Now, if you don't want to do it that way, the easiest way to do it 
it's just to take these pin jumper pins that I tells you about, plug it in to the ground, plug it into the signal pin, and there you go. Error would be gone. And I'll show you that when we boot this computer up. Now the next error you get is the USB 2, which is actually the blue connector right over here. So these pins are a little smaller, it's the USB 3, and let's actually switch to my diagram. There's 20 pins in total, going from left to right. Now if you look at the connector, you're going to actually see the square, and the reason why I use this as a square is that's the one that has no pin that is present. And I don't know if you can see it right over there, but there's no pin right over there. So with that one, this is our left as our reference, and this is the right. So what you're going to do on this one is the pins over here, and this would be the first one on the top right, one, and then you have two, three, and four. Pins one and four on the top row, on the right hand side, need to get jumpered together. And what that does is that creates the signal and the ground short that it needs to make to trick the computer into thinking that it's working. Now, you could just plug it in and jumper it like I'll show you, or what you can do is you could get a USB 3 adapter, kind of sort of like this, but ones where the pins show like that, I usually either get an extender, and then you just jump them together, and that will work fine. So then for that one, I'm going to go on pin 1, which is the top right. I'm going to skip over 4, so it's going to be 1, which is that pin, 2 and 3, and 4 right over here, which goes in right there just like that. And that will bypass that error and you don't have to worry about this. Now this is the way to go if you're using an older case that doesn't have this USB 3. Then you could just do it this way and not have to worry about it. Or you could get a USB 3 to USB 2 adapter. That will work fine. And then just find a way to junction it so that it tricks it for the errors. Another thing to do if you're going to do it this way, use a little bit of hot glue gun, which I'll probably end up doing when I do this build. And the reason why is, is that these pins are small, these are loose, and they will come out. So that's going to be the best way to do it. All right, so we got everything plugged in, CPU is mounted. I went ahead and used the jumper so you can kind of see that by jumpering these pins that we talked about gets rid of the errors. Now let's go ahead and let's show you that everything works. All right, our power. We got our LED, computer's booting up. Now I have no drive installed, so as you can see, it's already booting into that Intel boot agent for the ethernet. Of course, we don't have that, but as you can see, it booted right up to when to go find the drive. It's not in there, obviously, but we have no errors, no USB errors, no audio errors. Our lights work. This thing powers on, powers off, and then when we do the splicing into the new case for this, as far as the uh, USB, we'll be able to use our front USB and our front audio. So, so now that this works, what we're going to go ahead and do is take this case that was thrown out in the trash, which I've already went ahead, refurbished it, spray painted the inside to make it look a lot prettier. We got this power supply that we're going to use, which will be perfect. We could pop in a full size graphics card, put a little more memory into it, and let's turn this into a gaming computer.
the case swap for this is exactly the same as the HP Z240. Very simple, very easy to do, and something I do recommend it. So now one of the questions I get all the time is why do this? Number one, if you're an enthusiast, this is something that you just like to do. Why not take your hardware, mod it, and just case swap it? Why not do something like that? Number one, it's going to give you more upgrade path. And number two, it's going to let your hardware last a little longer. By taking this motherboard and CPU and cooler, we are able to pop it in a better case, use a traditional power supply, and use whatever graphics card that we want to. So, yeah, why not do it? The price of these motherboards are going for $10, and even with the adapter, you could be into this $20 just for the motherboard if you just want to buy the motherboard. And the fact that these OEMs are being retired and thrown out, they could be had for anywhere from $40 to $60, maybe a little more depending if you have the i7 variant, but the i5s are going for about $60 on eBay. So it's definitely something to consider. So now, of course, we upgraded our memory, 16 gigs of DDR3, our W4100 graphics card because, well, it's actually a pretty decent graphics card for the price that you pay for it, so why not use it? So overall, a pretty easy case swap, and of course, this case right over here looks fantastic as it was thrown in the trash. We just spray painted it a little bit with black spray paint, because guys, if you have a case, an older case with those plastic windows or anything like that, spray paint the inside a little black, it looks really good and helps it to pop. So now a few things to know about doing this case swap. Number one, and I get this question all the time too, the rear IO plate, yes, it doesn't have it. There actually is a template so you could 3D print it. I'll post a link below to it and you could get it 3D printed. Unfortunately, I don't have a 3D printer, but there is somebody who uh, came up with a template for that. So there is something that for that you can do. Now, the next thing to note, if you see over here, if you looked, our USB 3, I just went ahead and just did the jumper on it. And I jumped those pins that we talked about primarily because this case doesn't have the provisions for it. Our power supply connector adapter, I just went ahead and I taped it with black electrical tape because number one, it just looks better instead of having those ketchup and mustard cables just lying all the way around. Now unfortunately cable management is not the best in this case so don't geek me too much on that. As far as fans, I just went ahead and just used some adapters uh, to go from PWM to SATA power. That works fine. They work great. They're quiet enough and it definitely gets the job done. The motherboards over here, they don't have provisions for uh, PWM. In fact, I don't think they have any now that I look, about, look at it. Yeah, all you have is the one for the CPU fan header, so you might have to consider that. And GIM up here and all these other companies, there's a whole bunch of companies that make those uh, five pack for like $20, $30 that work pretty decent and actually give your computer a decent look. Now, as far as the graphics card, my recommendation for that one, something to keep in mind is, is if you look, it's a little tight from where that connector is to where the graphics card is. So if you use a larger graphics card, just kind of keep that in mind. So if you're going to fill in that connector, the USB 3, I do recommend getting a right angle one is that will let it come down lower and you should be able to clear larger graphics cards. Now, as far as this case swap, if you have the small form factor of this HP, this is ideal and way to go because the other way you're limited to a low profile graphics cards, which they tend to cost a lot of money just because they're low profile. But if you don't have the small form factor one and you just have the regular um, MATX case version of the HP Elite, then all you need to really do is just get that adapter for the power supply, pop in a traditional power supply, and you can upgrade it a lot easier. But at least going this way, you get more options of the case you wanna use. So, hope you guys liked the video. Definitely let me know if you have any questions about this. Thanks for watching, and we'll see what we come up with next.